Today I'm mapping a copper prospect south of Cloncurry in North Queensland. It's the middle of the dry season and at this time of year most of the vegetation is normally dead and that's ideal for mapping. But they've had a couple of exceptionally good wet seasons and as you can see there's still an enormous amount of green vegetation covering up all the outcrops. But fortunately some of that vegetation can actually help you find copper. Many thanks here to Dr Richard Lilly from the National Exploration Undercover School. He did a lot of work around Mount Isa to figure out which plants are associated with mineralisation and what all the species names are. He made a really good poster that helped me to get familiar with all those species and I'll put a link in the description below so you can download that poster and get familiar with them yourself. There's a few species that can help you to decide if that outcrop hiding in the grass is something good or just another brown rock. You'll have to forgive me with the pronunciation of the technical names. I'm a geologist, not a botanist. But I'll put the names in the video description so you can look them up at your leisure. In the Cloncurry Mount Isa region in Northern Australia, one of the most useful plants is copper grass, Eriacne mucronata. It's probably the best known copper indicator plant in the region. It likes to grow in exposed areas in rocky soils immediately downslope from a source of copper. This is copper grass, Eriacne mucronata. It's growing around the edge of a little pit here just behind the camera and there's lots of gossam on the mullock dump over there. So I'm guessing it's an old copper working. Eriacne mucronata is a really tough plant. If there's any copper around, you'll often find it growing on the top of dry, rocky ridges where there isn't much soil. This specimen here has managed to cling to existence in nothing more than a crack in this big boulder with no soil at all. And the boulder is a nice big lump of hydrothermal breccia. It's got these darker grey fragments in a white matrix of coxcomb quartz. And that white quartz doesn't have much of anything in it, but the grey colour in these fragments is due to very fine grain sulphides. And now I'm thinking that some of that sulphide might be chalcopyrite, so I'd better take a sample. This one's a little bit more difficult to pick than some of the other species because it's got lots of close cousins that look very similar but grow just about everywhere. I've noticed in the Cloncurry area that there's another species that very closely resembles Eriacne mucronata, except that it has a more compact growth form. I suspect it might be the Dominii subspecies of Eriacne pulchella, but I haven't been able to confirm that yet. It may have some tolerance for copper in soils, but it also seems to favour exposed rocky ridges that are unmineralised. A much more common imposter in Northern Australia is Eniapagon polyphyllus. It's important to get familiar with this one so you can exclude it because it grows in a wide variety of unmineralised environments all over Northern Australia. Probably the most useful plant is little copper grass, Bulbostylus barbata. It's actually a type of sedge and like other sedges it can tolerate water saturated soils which explains why you commonly find it growing on the floor of old mine pits with other copper indicator plants growing on the surrounding dumps and outcrops. Bulbostylus babata seems to be one of the most reliable indicators of copper, perhaps because it's one of the most tolerant of high copper concentrations. I'm in an old copper mine, as you can see by the bright blue and green colours all around me. So the copper concentrations in the soil here are extremely high. And right below me here, you can see a thick carpet of Bulbostylus barbata growing very healthily, and it's the only plant. So that indicates that A, it can tolerate extremely high concentrations of copper, and B, it's just about the only plant that can. The bottom of this pit collects water. So in a dry climate like this, it's the perfect niche environment for plants that can tolerate extreme copper concentrations. And here's another patch of it here growing on top of the mullock dump. And not only is there a lot of copper up here, but this patch of white crusty sulphates here coming from oxidising sulphide ore 
tells you that the pH of the soil here must be extremely low. So not only can Bulbostylus barbata tolerate very high copper, it can also tolerate extremely acid soil. So here's a really tough plant that somehow found a way to survive and thrive in an environment that will just kill almost everything else. Now here's another example of just how useful those copper indicator plants can be. I've spent all day out there in the Proterozoic rocks looking for copper deposits. But on the way home, the shortest route to the truck was over these Cambrian sediments, the cover rocks here, which are not supposed to have any copper in them. As it happens, I've been following this nice fault breccia, which cuts up through the basement and then into the Cambrian cover rocks. But just look here, that's Bulbostylus barbata, little copper grass. And that means one of two things, either there's some really nice copper mineralization in the basement, some 100 meters or more below me here, linking up the fault to feed these plants, or there's some copper somewhere in the Cambrian sediments, and that'd really put the cat among the pigeons. As I mentioned, Bulbostylus barbata seems to be one of the most specific indicators of high copper concentrations in the soil. On top of that, it occurs in subtropical regions all over the world so it surely ranks near the top of the useful plants list. Another plant that might be a useful indicator is Fimbrostylus dicotoma. Its common name is tall fringe grass because it likes to grow along the edge of watercourses, so it probably has a tolerance for saturated soils like those you find in the bottom of old mine pits. I've seen it growing alongside little copper grass, so it must also have a high tolerance for copper in soils. It has a distinctive seed head on radiating twisted stems with a zigzag pattern just below the head. Probably the second best known indicator plants, at least in the Mount Isa region, are species of Polycarpia. Polycarpia spirostylus, or little copper bush, is the most abundant member of the species in Western Queensland. The larger brother, known simply as copper bush, is the subspecies Polycarpia spirostylus glabra. It seems to grow in areas with slightly higher rainfall. This example is growing on the floor of an old open cut copper mine on Cape York. Here's an example where some little copper bush helped me to follow a mineralized quartz vein that was mostly undercover. Now, on the face of it, it doesn't look terribly interesting. It's buck textured quartz, it's got a very occasional box work after sulphide, and there's a bit of magnetite scattered around in here. That's pretty much like all of the other quartz ridges all over this place. But there's something different here, that. That's Polycarpia spirostylus. And you can see it's all over the outcrop here. And over there we've got spinifex, and over there we've got lots of native grasses. But Polycarpia is about the only thing that can survive on this ridge here. Now, on its own, that's at least an indicator of about 500 ppm copper in the soil. And since even the spinifex can't survive here, it's probably over a thousand. There's an old copper mine about 200 meters up that way. And I know the mineralization there is hosted in a shear zone with lots of buck quartz. But there's buck quartz all over the place here. And I've been trying to figure out which one is the load with the good stuff and I'd say that's a pretty good clue that I'm on the right track. I'm in the floor of the old mine pit here and you can see it's growing thick with polycarpia. And over here we've got great bushes of Bulbostylus barbata. So the combination of those two growing in the same patch tells me absolutely that this is a copper prospect and there's lots and lots of copper in the soil here. And here's another patch of it here. See, I've got Polycarpia here. There's native grasses over there and Spinifex over here. And since Polycarpia is the only thing growing here, even though there's no outcrop, I know that there's a lot of copper in the soil here. So I followed those little clumps of Polycarpia along strike for a couple of hundred meters, and then it went under cover in a big wide creek. So I used my GPS to follow the strike direction across the creek and out the other side of the cover and what did I find? 
this. A big quartz vein with some nice gossen in it and a little historical pit that is just full of polycarpia and Bulbostylus barbata. This clearly is an old copper working and that structure is really big. I'm actually a little bit green colour blind and that can be a bit of a downside if you're a copper geologist. But when you learn to read the rocks in combination with the plants, you don't need that green vision quite so much. These things can be signposts that'll point you in the direction of the good stuff. But like all useful rules, there are some exceptions. I'm on a dry, sandy sheet wash plain here where I know that soil samples have returned just background levels of copper, 50 odd ppm. So it's unlikely that there's any copper mineralization around here. But I'm standing in the middle of a big patch of Polycarpia spirostylus, little copper bush. So how is that? Well, this bush and most of the other copper bushes have learned to survive in several environments where other plants just find it too tough. And this is one of them. So this is no absolute guarantee of an indicator for copper. I see it more like a, a red flag that should wake up your spider sense. So you start looking around for other evidence of mineralization. Bits of goss and float or quartz veins or signs of old workings. And if you find some evidence of that, then seeing those copper plants can give you some more confidence that maybe there's copper associated with that mineralization. And particularly if you see two or more of those copper plants together, then that level of confidence can jump up a level. This is another video in the series of field craft for geologists. This is the highlights version for YouTube. If you'd like to see some more detail on how to identify those copper indicator plants, then go to the link in the description below and for the price of a couple of copper assays, you'll get the full version of this video, all the other videos in the Fieldcraft series, and anything else I shoot as I find interesting things in the field.